1813 was an interesting year, wasn't it? It was the year Napoleon lost the Battle of Leipzig. A fellow called Charles Babbage invented the first automatic digital computer. And a young woman of 35 published her second novel in three volumes, which she'd started writing when she was only 20. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Now, if you haven't been paying attention since 1813 and you don't know the plot, here it is. Mr. Darcy, a rich landowner, encounters Elizabeth Bennet and behaves like an arrogant jerk. She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. Next, Mr. Darcy unexpectedly proposes to the same Elizabeth Bennet, but does it in the most ham-fisted way he could. The very beginning of my acquaintance with you, I was impressed by your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others. In fact, I had not known you a month before I felt you were the very last man in the world who I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. Darcy and Elizabeth meet again by chance and their relationship starts to thaw as they find out more about each other. Please let me say this. Please allow me to thank you on behalf of all my family since they don't know to whom they are indebted. And finally the big finish. The music swells, they clinch, fade out. Every year for new generations there are new adaptations, new parodies, new spin-offs. Everybody knows that a single man with money needs to get himself a wife. I have five beautiful and very single daughters. A church goer and single? Which one of you girls wants it? <laughs> Mother, I do not need a blind date, particularly not with some verbally incontinent spinster who smokes like a chimney, drinks like a fish and dresses like her mother. There must be many single men of good fortune in a town like this. You're not dancing this evening. No, just looking, thank you. You've monopolized the only attractive girl in the room. Hope is beautiful, isn't she? I warn you, your charms will be estimated in terms of your bank balance. <laughs> you're not the sort of girl that I normally go out with. I mean, you know, you're loud, you're disorganized, your friends are an embarrassment. But, um, I, uh, I like you. I don't know why. Are you serious? Will you have, uh, dinner with me tomorrow night? No. Why? When I first met you, I thought you were rude, arrogant, intolerant, and insensitive. But over the last few days, I thought maybe, maybe I made a mistake. That I was right. You're the last person I'd ever want to be with. In the early days of silent movies, producers found adapting classic novels very appealing. There was name recognition and, very important, the properties were so old there was no copyright restriction. Filmmakers favoured stories with action and complex novels were reduced to adventure yarns. Producers loved showing off and fantastical tales gave them a chance to display this new camera magic. Like Alice shrinking to get through her tiny door. Some more ambitious filmmakers attempted adapting Charles Dickens books, but without the dialogue, these movies were a lost cause. And as for Shakespeare without words, forget about it. Now the movie business, awash with money, is arrogant. Imagine if Hollywood had bitten early. Darcy might have been turned into a swashbuckling hero and Lizzie Bennet into a vamp. Let's thank goodness that Jane Austen failed a novelty test. So her entry into the mass market came another way. In 1895, an Italian-born English actress and drama teacher, Rosina Filippi, published duologues and scenes from the novels of Jane Austen. Excerpts from Emma, Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice were designed to be performed simply by reading excerpts from the books. And in case you think that's a rather pedestrian way of bringing Jane Austen to life, not a bit of it. Remember, she writes great dialogue. And this is what it must have been like to experience one of those early readings. You have no compassion for my poor nerves. Oh, you mistake me, my dear. I have a very high respect for your nerves. <laughs> they are my old friends. 
I have heard you mention them with consideration these last 20 years at least. Ah, oh, you do not know what I suffer. But I hope you will get over it and live to see many young men of 4,000 a year come into the neighbourhood. They were a big success with rich, upper-middle-class ladies of the New Woman Movement, which was an early version of the women's rights and suffragettes. The romantic aspects of the story were played down. There were ten females on the cast and only four men. And because he didn't fit Rosina's agenda, she didn't require tall, dark and handsome after all, Fitzwilliam Darcy was simply left out. Four years later, Rosina Filippi adapted the novel for the stage. It was called The Bennets, and it premiered at the Royal Court Theatre in 1901. The actor-producer Harcourt Williams became the first real-life Mr Darcy. But it was Helen Jerome's 1935 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice which took Broadway and the West End by storm. It became the most influential play because of its emphasis on romance, and it caught the eye of Hollywood. There's an apocryphal story that it was Harpo Marx who saw Pride and Prejudice in New York and rang up his Hollywood pal Irving Thalberg and said, uh, there's a play here and I think it'll be a very good vehicle for your wife. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Thalberg bought the play and filming of his production of Pride and Prejudice was scheduled to begin in 1936 with Norma Shearer, of course, as Elizabeth and Clark Gable. Clark Gable as Darcy. Would he have been a good Darcy? Hey, he was famous. He was a star. And this is Hollywood. We're a million miles away from the pure Jane Austen. Sadly, Irving Thalberg died suddenly, and the project fell into that movie netherworld of on again, off again, perhaps, maybe, you know, what they call development. At one point in Hollywood speak, it became Wuthering Heights meets Little Women. And Catherine Hepburn was even slated to play Elizabeth Bennet. Casting Darcy also turned out to be problematic. At one point, Robert Donat, Melvin Douglas, and even Robert Taylor were in the running. Eventually, everybody agreed on the script. And luckily, one of the co-writers of the final draft was Brave New World author Aldous Huxley, and his wife was a big Jane Austen fan. So a lot of the material from the book that had been cut out was put back into the final script. In 1940, this is how 30 million people, most of whom had never read the book, were introduced for the first time to Elizabeth Bennet and Fitzwilliam Darcy. Now that you've been forewarned of my eagerness to dance with you, may I hope that you will do me the honor? I am afraid that the honor of standing up with you, Mr. Darcy, is more than I can bear. Pray excuse me. Lawrence Olivier's depiction of Darcy is important. He was dark and brooding Sir, and sexy. Like any good movie star, he brought his own vibe to the film, and he influenced a slew of actors who took on the part on the newfangled medium of television, thanks to the BBC. Andrew Osborne was the first BBC Darcy back in 1938, Peter Cushing in 1952, Alan Bedell in 1959, Louis Fiander in 1967, David Rintoul in 1989, and Colin Firth in 1995. Television in Britain had been bogged down with heavy video cameras. Video technology was primitive. The sets were small. The images were blurred. Early productions of Pride and Prejudice were essentially stage plays recorded in real time. Mr. Bennett! Mr. Bennett! Mama has heard the news. Dear Mama. Until the Elizabeth Garvey David Rintoul series, a number of things contributed to make this a breakthrough show. In 1967, colour TV arrived in Britain. Videotape editing improved. There were shorter scenes. No longer did actors need to rush from set to set while dialogue was inserted to cover the real-time move. Of course, be overjoyed to see you. Thank you, Mr. Bingley. What extraordinary behaviour. Whatever can she mean by it? She has nothing in short to recommend her but being an excellent walker. I shall never forget her appearance just now. She really looked almost wild. Sweet Miss Lizzie, you should not have troubled to come. But now I'm here and I certainly shall not leave until you're perfectly well again. As videotape editing improved, additional dialogue was no longer needed. Now the buzzword was pace. How is she? Exteriors were no longer filmed on scratchy black and white 16mm film. 
technology influences content. With better equipment, the producers ventured out and featured real buildings standing in for the characters' homes. Tourists now visited the locations and gradually Jane Austen became absorbed into what we call Heritage Britain. Like a fresh impression of the movie and then you see the house like that soon yeah. after. It's great. Yeah, it the entire weird. experience. <laughs> I'm just wow. Miss Elizabeth. What's more, by using exteriors more and more, because they could, the nature of the storytelling changed. I thought you were in London. No. No, I'm not. We have uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennet bumping into Darcy at Pemberley, right near the end, and they have a really, really boring conversation. Are you staying at Lambton? Yes, at the Rose and Crown. Yes, sir. The wonderful thing is that the actors, by their performance, are supplying the novel, the world of the novel, the interior world of the novel, and what their faces are telling us, because a good screen actor, it's to do with reacting as much as acting, it's to do with what they don't say as much as what they, their faces are telling us. Yes. I, I love you more than I can say. I can hardly yes, I bear to look at you. We could be so happy here, but it's never going to happen. But that's the subtext, because screenwriting is all about subtext. And it was lovely watching that scene and seeing what Matthew McFadden and Kira Knightley did, did with that very banal British buttoned up conversation. His name is Bingy. Is he married or single? But no amount of subtext can fill in the blanks of, say, Jane Austen's description of the hollow, desperate marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Bennet. It's usually played for laughs. I've never seen an adaptation which fully nails this description by Jane Austen of their sad marriage. Her father, captivated by youth and beauty, and that appearance of good humour which youth and beauty generally give, had married a woman whose weak understanding and illiberal mind had very early in their marriage put an end to all real affection for her. Respect, esteem and confidence had vanished forever and all his views of domestic happiness were overthrown. By adapting the novel, one character is always left out, the narrator, Jane Austen herself. And so her observations, her commentary, her insight falls by the wayside, especially in her character's most intimate moments like this one, Elizabeth's self-discovery. How despicably I have acted, she cried. I who have prided myself on my discernment. I who have valued myself on my abilities, who have often disdained the generous candor of my sister and gratified my vanity in useless or blameless mistrust. How humiliating is this discovery, yet how just a humiliation. Till this moment I never knew myself. Many people can be credited with the reimagining of Pride and Prejudice, but none more so than the scriptwriter of the 1995 BBC TV adaptation Andrew Davis. Don't be afraid to add in scenes. Now let's see Darcy in his bath, let's see him diving in his lake, let's see him fencing, let's see him riding, let's see him out of breath. In a long and distinguished television career, Andrew Davis had never been cowed by his source material. Evidence is this iconic line which he added to the Michael Dobbs novel House of Cards. You might think that. I couldn't possibly comment. See how one line can be the only thing an audience remembers from a show? But that was nothing compared to what he did with this scene. And remember, this is another version of the same scene we saw earlier with Matthew McFadden and Kira Knightley. Mr. Darcy? Miss Bennet? I... Uh... I did not expect to see you, sir. We understood all the family from home, or we should never have presumed. I returned a day early. Texas, 2016. An exhibition of artifacts of William Shakespeare and Jane Austen. And it features, as its centerpiece, yes, 
the wet white shirt. Missing this. And what about 30 um, Folger staff members, most of them young women, not yeah, all, but almost exclusively, almost exclusively yeah, um, came, flocked down to see the shirt, and they immediately put on this unrehearsed, spontaneous performance of worship. It, it, was, really it was really, I mean, there, at one point a young woman was prostrated on the floor bef before the shirt. And in 2022, that shirt is back in Jane Austen's house, where it's a treat to set before the Queen. We're here to get to know the real Colin Firth, the complex man behind the wet shirt. So in this interconnected world of the media, we have Colin Firth playing Darcy and then being interviewed as himself by René Zellweger in the character of Bridget Jones while being rejected in the movie Bridget Jones' Diary oh, by Colin Firth playing Mark in Darcy. In, in so how many program. takes did you have to do diving into the actual lake? Well, all my bits were, were done in a tank in Ealing. <laughs> Can I just ask you, you know when you were in the wet shirt and everything? Did you realise your nipples were showing through? It's been lovely to meet you. Bye. It is true. We have more media, new, new means of diffusion, so we need more stories. Um, but we aren't just making up new stories. We're retelling old stories, but we always have. We've always retold stories. I mean, only one of Shakespeare's plays is not an adaptation, and even it adapts conventions from other things. So this is the history of how we've always done. Why do we denigrate it? It's a Shakespearean theme. I will live a bachelor. A dear happiness to women. Opposites attract. I will marry you. I run a The very last man on earth I could be prevailed upon to marry. And Jane Austen ran with it. You have said enough, Miss Lizzie. Thank you for making your feelings known. I am sorry that my affection and offer of marriage have offended you so. I will take care not to repeat them. Cut. That was breathtaking. The accent. Barely noticeable. No, I got so many words wrong. I really believe that you hated him. Liam, wasn't she fantastic? So, Spencer, the costume designer, is here. Let's get you over to wardrobe to try on what he has in mind for Lizzie. Okay. And now the motif is a mainstay of modern rom-coms. I just... I just don't get the stupid pseudo-surrealist crap. It's not crap. What'd you say? I said it's not crap. How do you know? Oh, A+. Plus. Sorry, I didn't know I was speaking to an expert. Well, now you know. Smith didn't say anything to me about a new owner showing up. Well, why should he? For all I know, you're just some squatter. Now, hold on a minute. Derek? Oh, didn't know you had company. She was just leaving. <laughs> Are you always this hostile? I'm sorry. We seem to rub each other in the wrong way. Yeah, I suppose I can be abrasive. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. What does that mean, exactly? Nothing. Do you know some of the characters in Pride and Prejudice have trickled down through time in various incarnations? Take the dreadful battle axe Lady Catherine de Bourgh. On my word, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Pray, what is your age? With three younger sisters grown up, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own to it. Well, of course, I also own a house in Belgrave Square. Number? 149. The unfashionable side. Is that the way they teach you to stand in the police force nowadays? Is there anything I can do, Aunt Agatha? Oh, yes, there is. You can leave. I have enough to bear without your imbecilities. Can I tempt you to one of these new cocktails? I, I don't think so. They look too exciting for so early in the evening, don't you think so, Gus? Better avoid it, my lady. And then there's the hapless Mr. Collins, reinterpreted endlessly. Now, Jane Austen admits he's a bit of a creep. What extraordinary condescension. I'm quite delighted at this for Miss Elizabeth's sake. But over the years, he's become quite the comic turn. That is the home of my patroness, the right honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh herself was kind enough to suggest that these shelves be fitted exactly as you see them there. What a superbly featured room and what excellent boiled potatoes. Many years since I've had such an exemplary vegetable. And frankly, I blame Jane Austen for British media being flooded with silly-ass clerics over the years. Sir, sir, what's a virgin? Are you a virgin? 
Richard, sir. No, no, I'm not. May Almighty God bless you all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Pride and Prejudice has a universal, a global appeal, because it's about human nature, even though it's set in another time, another place, Regency England, where the conventions of wealth and class are different from our own. <laughs> that society doesn't exist today. No, not interested. She's okay. Or does it? I'm not ready to be married. I, I really can't accept. <laughs> well, Lalita, I'm offering to take you to America. Huh? You and your family will have no more worries. I could never be the kind of wife that could make you happy. And I don't think you could make me happy either. Yeah, it's very easy for us, um, you know, in the Commonwealth and with our post-colonial legacy to sort of draw parallels between the Regency era 200 years ago and our society here in South Asia right now. And um, it's always very amusing and entertaining, but then there's a dark side to it as well. I mean, the misogyny and the hypocrisy and keeping up appearances. Oh, yeah. We still have a lot of similarities with um, 200 years ago England. And that's basically, especially for women, our sphere is limited. Um, the power we have over our own lives is limited. Our financial independence is limited. Do I need to go on more? And he has 5,000 a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? Um, how can it affect them? Jane Austen's Elizabeth Bennet has become the perfect woman, and over the years she's been given the best lines. For a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Even if they're the narrators and not hers. When did you first discover the power of poetry in driving away love? <laughs> I thought the poetry was the food of love. Of a fine stout love, it may. But if it is only a vague inclination, I'm convinced one poor sonnet will kill it stone dead. So what do you recommend to encourage affection? Dancing. I have not that talent which some possess of conversing easily with strangers. I do not play this instrument so well as I should wish to. But I have always supposed that to be my own fault. Promise me that you will never marry him and I will make it worth your while. I don't make promises to my own mother. Why should I promise anything to you? Excuse me. I think that it was the most revolutionary feminist novel that I'd ever read. That a woman of that era would have the strength to reject Darcy when he treated her poorly. It's a load. It was Darcy's very attitude that attracted Elizabeth to him. Darcy's attitude was rude and mocking. I think that he was lucky to be with a woman with as much integrity as Elizabeth. The only reason he even asked her to marry him was because she wouldn't stop throwing herself throwing at him. Throwing herself at him? He was pursuing her. She's clearly not satisfied with her life and is looking for excitement wherever she can get it. Well, I think that it's obviously all in his head that she had any feelings for him at all. Well, there you have it. That's the power of a good book. The 124,713 words carefully crafted by Jane Austen is more than just a great novel these days. It's become an obsession. It is a truth generally acknowledged that we are all longing to escape. I escape always to my favorite book, Pride and Prejudice. I've read it so many times now, the words just say themselves in my head and it's like a window opening. It's like I'm actually there. It's become a place I know so intimately. I can see that world, I can touch it. Books pour out every year, telling the original story again and again, or using the characters in new ways. Pride and Prejudice, the murder mystery. Embroiled in a murder mystery. He's been hit by something hard. Pride and Prejudice, the horror fantasy. Bennett. And even musicals. You have had your say, and you've cut me down, and you've brought me to my senses. 
to the master of Netherfield. The bewildering world of social media, the good book is being overwhelmed. We're no longer just the consumers of literature, we can become the participants in it. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. The fans of Jane Austen, known as Janeites, jealously guard their heroine, exploring every nook and cranny of her world. There are all kinds of people who come to this conference. There are scholars of Austen, there are historians, there are sociologists and psychologists. And there are plenty of people who have read her books and just enjoy them. But there are also people who come because they're interested in the costumes of the period and living as though they're in the period. The variety of people who come is just astonishing. Now, I'm no expert on Pride and Prejudice. I'm just a reader. I read it when I was 15 and I've read it dozens of times since then. I'm a fan, but I want to add just one word to the discussion about it. And that word is indestructible. Would you excuse us, madam? Very gladly, Mr. Darcy. When you die, Mr. Bennett, which may in fact be very soon, right. our oh, girls will be left without a roof over their head, head nor a penny to their name. Oh, My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. That is a failing indeed. I myself have a remarkable appetite. Why, only yesterday Lady Metcalf complimented me upon it. She says she will wear it to church. Tell her she shall not, Mama. I shall wear it, Mama. I beg you would turn this over. It's all my own work. So you are Elizabeth Bennet? I am, Your Ladyship. Hmm. I must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, dancing, drawing, and modern languages. In the manner of walking in the tone of her voice, her address and expressions. And of course she must improve her mind by extensive reading. I'm no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather want to know out your knowing any. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And uh, I will never see you again if you do. Sir, you kiss my gloves. I would kiss your every garment. One can't help but be distracted and influenced by the adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. The novel is more than just a love story, but most adaptations make it just a love story. They're entertaining, they're fun, but not even close to encompassing the tale of manners that Jane Austen wrote. One of Miss Bennet's uncles is an attorney. And another is engaged in trade. Turn on sound. And board. Sound speed. Aye. Mr. Darcy. It's the truth universally acknowledged that the moment one area of your life starts going okay, another part of it falls spectacularly to pieces. Over 200 years, the book Pride and Prejudice has sold 20 million copies, but hundreds of millions have seen the adaptations. Who can argue with success? The only way to get a man like Mr. Darcy is to make him up. It's a story that has resonated the generations, captivated hundreds of millions of people, and it ends happily ever after. And that surely is something to celebrate. If your feelings are still what they were last summer, tell me so at once. My sentiments have undergone so material a change as to make me receive your present assurances with gratitude.